Awesome. Well, we are so grateful that you're here. My name is Jordan Hanson. I serve here as lead pastor. And I'm just grateful that you braved the wind and the rain to come to church to worship God. We have been in the middle of a 21-day series on prayer. Four Sundays, but a 21-day focus, which you do twice a year. And we really give people an opportunity to pray and fast with a little bit extra of a focus on uh, those particular spiritual disciplines. And part of the reason is, is because we live in such a distracted and busy culture. You know, we realize that our connection to God is dependent on prayer, and yet uh, sometimes our schedule drives our relationship with God uh, instead of our relationship with God driving our schedule. And so, hey, you know, twice a year we recognize that this is the world that we live in. It's a part of the reality that we uh, are in, and we just say, hey, let's just focus on our relationship with the Lord, specifically through prayer and fasting. And so as I was praying about this series, I really came up against a wall because uh, anytime we talk about prayer, the issue of unanswered prayers always comes up. In my own life, uh, there have been times where I have really felt like I was in a pit, right? Stuck. And there were some prayers that seemed to me like they were being or left unanswered. Just quick pull of hands, because I like to do this. Let's keep it real. How many of you have ever in your whole life felt like there was a time where God was not answering your prayers? All right, there's a few perfect saints in here, but <laughs> but hey, that's, that's, that's the description of my life. There have been seasons and even parts of my prayer journey, even now that sometimes it feels like these are unanswered prayers. And today we're going to dive into the pitfall prayers. And these are prayers that I believe are designed to get stuck. In fact, they're supposed to stay there. <laughs> but even when our prayers are failing, they're still good for something, okay? They reveal our need for Jesus who connects us to God and transforms our prayer approach. How many know that Jesus converts us, but he also wants to convert our prayers, how many of you pray differently now than you did 30 years ago when you first came to Christ? <laughs> this is a journey, isn't it? We're going to discover how Jesus uses unanswered prayers to transform our hearts and lives. But let's just get a couple of those prayers out in the open. And these are sort of a little extreme, maybe a little hyperbolic. So I'm sure none of you pray like this, but maybe you can resonate. Maybe there was a time in your life that you did. Lord, I need this right now. <laughs> now, Lord. Father, can you just give me that Ferrari? I have been persistently praying. No other Ferrari lovers in here? Now I just drive down to Balboa Island and envy all of the Ferraris I see. No, I know, that's a sin. <laughs> Lord, I will follow you if you help me pass this test. If. Lord, you've forgiven me, but I can't forgive my neighbor. They're so loud. Is, is that petty? <laughs> Jesus, you are awesome. You are awesome. And so am I, might I add. Jesus, I'm not as bad as those people. You know those other people who aren't as good as me. Lord, I didn't even know why. I, I don't even know why I call you that. Lord, because, well, you aren't. I do what I want. So, again, these might not be your prayers, but they might be thoughts in your head, okay? Or, or, or at least reveal these actions could be revealed through your actions. God, you know I can't open up to these people if they only knew what was really inside of me. God, I have zero problems with the stuff in my life. Stuff is the word we sometimes use for sin, which is just stuff, right? A little more palatable. And, and, and you shouldn't have any problem answering my prayers. Here's the deal. Pitfall prayers are designed to get stuck. Now, just, I just want you to understand this. Most of the time when I preach, I'm going to use one passage, expound the passage, try to apply the passage. This is not one of those Sundays. In fact, I'm not even sure I've ever done this the whole time I'm here. This is purely a topical sermon, and I have literally taken about 11 or 12 different verses from Scripture. I, I think the way that I apply all of the Scriptures will be exegetically faithful, so don't worry, all right? You're in an orthodox, orthodoxically safe place. 
But I just wanted to let you know, I love to preach through books and I love to preach through passages, but today is going to be a little different. Pitfall prayers are designed to get stuck. They're designed to get stuck. Now, before I talk about, uh, and I'm going to give a name to nine different prayers, I want you to understand that we have a danger whenever we talk about prayers or praying in a way that doesn't fully reflect Jesus' intentions for us. We can make one of two mistakes. One, we can judge others for their prayers. Don't do that. It's really hard to judge someone's motivation. But the one that I think is worse is when we judge ourselves, when we condemn ourselves. And so I just want to remind you that 2 Corinthians 5.17 says that when you come to Christ, you're a new creation. You are no longer your prayers. You are the person that is praying your prayers, and you are redeemed. Just like I would say you are no longer your sin, you are redeemed. You are a new creation. You still may have temptations and struggles in certain areas, but there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ. That's Romans. All right, so let's talk about the nine prayers that uh, get stuck, probably need to stay stuck, and we'll talk about how God can convert our prayers. The first prayer is the impatient prayer, and I don't want to spend a lot of time on this because we're actually going to talk about this in depth next week. In fact, I think this particular prayer really needs a whole message. To be honest, all of these, this could be a nine-week series, but I'm not going to. This is a survey sermon. Someday. I mean, I don't plan on leaving, so we might do a nine week sermon in a couple years who knows and it'll be this outline ecclesiastes 3 1 says for everything there is a season a time for every activity under heaven sometimes we pray things outside of the timing of god that's a stuck prayer it's a pitfall prayer the second one is selfish prayer james 4 3 says and even when you ask you don't get it because your motives are all wrong you want only what will give you pleasure it's a selfish prayer I'm seeking to answer a prayer that really is only going to impact me. That's a pitfall prayer. The third one is a divided prayer. It's a little different than the name might suggest, but I'm going to explain it. But it's a pitfall prayer, a divided prayer. James 1, 6 through 7 in the New Living Translation says, But when you ask him, be sure that your faith is in God alone. Alone. Not divided, right? In God alone, not the gifts that he gives or the outcome that you're seeking, but in the God who gives the gift, in the God who changes the circumstance. Do not waver for a person with divided loyalty is as unsettled as a wave of the sea that is blown and tossed by the wind. Such people should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. That's a divided prayer. It's a pitfall prayer. It's going to it's going to make you feel stuck because if it's not honoring or reflecting Christ. God doesn't want to answer that prayer. Let me just make sure you understand. There are prayers that God doesn't want to answer in your life. (laughs) If you haven't caught the drift yet. That's the third pitfall prayer. The fourth pitfall prayer, say that three times fast, is the bitter prayer. The bitter prayer. Mark 11, 25. But when you are praying, first forgive anyone you are holding a grudge against so that your Father in heaven will forgive your sins too. Lord, you've forgiven me, but I, I, I don't know. You know, whatever crazy form of pettiness that I'm holding on to my heart. And that has 100% definitely been me. Okay? (laughs) Follow me as I follow Christ. Be honest. We're not even there yet, but I hope you will keep going with me. Number five, the attention-seeking prayer. There's a pitfall prayer. Matthew 6, 5 through 6. When you pray, don't be like the hypocrites who love to pray publicly on street corners and in synagogues where everyone can see them. I tell you the truth. That's all the reward they will ever get. They pray to people, not to God. They're seeking people's approval, not God's approval. It's a pitfall prayer. It's not a prayer designed to get God or to, for God to answer that. He just won't. Six, prideful prayer. Luke 18, 19, 9 through 14. But the Pharisee stood by himself and prayed this prayer. I thank God. That I am not like other people, cheaters, sinners, and adulterers. I'm certainly not like that tax collector. By the way, a lot of these prayers, you don't even realize you get into (laughs) them. It, It seems so hyperbolic, like, oh, I would just never pray that prayer. And yet our actions reveal sometimes that our hearts are maybe a little more prideful than we would like to admit. Number seven, the lawless prayer, Proverbs 28.9. I, I got to go back to the Old Testament here, right? Solomon wrote the Proverbs, timeless wisdom for generations. God detests 
the prayers of a person who ignores the law. Well, that's an ineffective prayer. That's a, that's a prayer that is going to get stuck. If you're the type of person who, who literally doesn't care about what God says, <laughs> show me how that's going to work for you. Because I can tell you from Scripture that um, not, not out of a desire for anything less than what God desires for you, it will not work. Uh, insincere prayer, number eight, James 5.16 says this, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The earnest prayer of a righteous person has great power and produces wonderful results. I mean, there have been many times where I probably, to be honest, I felt insincere in, in praying, right? Because I knew that um, I wasn't earnestly seeking after Christ like this in my life. I mean, if I were to speak about my journey as a believer, and then number nine, I, I call this one the, the most deceitful one, and that's why I'm going to address it first here in, uh, in a few minutes. It's this deceitful prayer. And our hearts are uh, wildly deceitful. And so this is why it's so important to be engaged with a body of believers who love you enough to tell you the truth. One of the greatest lies in American culture is that we think we can do uh, and be a Christian without other people speaking into that process. And a lot of times we get there because of church hurt. We're, well, someone stabbed us in the back with something we were honest about, and all of those things are legitimate threats, but the bigger legitimate threat is your own deceitful heart. <laughs> I mean, you, you'll be stuck in a little uh, dark corner of life thinking all is good and all is not good because you're not asking the types of questions that will expose the types of things that the Holy Spirit wants to do in you. Man, I, I, I hope you came for growth this morning. Man, if there's one thing I learned on my sabbatical is I cannot waste any time just trying to get you to like me anymore. I've given you eight years. <laughs> I'm just going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to preach my heart out every week. <laughs> like, <laughs> like a dying man unto dying men and women. I'm just a blind beggar who found some cheese, Okay. But deceitful prayer, Psalm 66, 18, if I had not confessed the sin in my heart, the Lord would not have listened. I, I want these nine prayers to sort of sink in because you may have been taught that every time you open your mouth, God is like this little genie who's going to come to your beck and call. And there is one prayer that I believe that God does that immediately and he's faithful to his word. <laughs> and that one word is Jesus. When you call out to Jesus, and that's the beginning of something, we're going to talk about that here in a second, but once Jesus is working in your life, he is working to remove the pitfalls in your prayer life so that you can live a life aligned with his purposes. Because here's the thing about pitfall prayers. There are prayers prayed by people. There are prayers prayed by people. There are prayers prayed by you and me. And they reveal something about us, don't they? They reveal something about us. Pitfall prayers don't work because they reveal something about our hearts. And in our relationship with God, there is nothing more important than the condition of our heart. And our prayer life is a thermometer or a gauge about the condition of our heart. So this is why we don't condemn ourselves for having prayers that don't work, but we do want to learn from them. We do want to take them as hints, as, uh, as, as clues to something deeper. And here's the deeper truth. It's also the most simple truth in all of Christianity. So if this is your first Sunday in church, start with this one. Pitfall prayers reveal that we need Jesus. See, even unanswered prayers are good for something. They are. They're good because they give us an invitation to think about how much we need the Lord to continue his work in us. And so you may have seen this, and I want to show you this, this picture. Uh, and, and this is a simple graphic. I sort of modified it a little bit. But this is one of those flannel graphs that you see in Sunday school. How many of you have seen something like this at some point? 
but you've never seen it on a 33 by 11 foot video wall. So come on, where are all my visual learners? <laughs> a lot of times people ask me, why did you put a 33 by, by 12 foot video wall in your auditorium? I said, because I'm tired of the church discriminating against visual learners. We don't like discrimination, right? That's why, if you want to know why. So all the visual learners are like, yes, now I understand. This, this is us before uh, our connection with the Lord. We're over here doing our own thing. Now, we're made in God's image, right? So, you know, there, there will be times that we get it right and times that our prayers uh, are, are good. But for the most part, we have no way of connecting with God. God is so perfectly holy over on the other side of that chasm. And because of sin, just this... This, this little thing that you might not think is that big of a deal. It's such a big deal. I'm actually going to take 10 weeks after this series, and I'm going to preach on the Ten Commandments. I am so pumped. I love the law of God. And you're going to see why. You can love the law of God, too. <laughs> because you have to frame it in the way that God intended you, you can't think about it in a legalistic lens. You have to think about it. So listen, don't judge me. Just come and, and hear, listen, be a part of that journey and, and, and how it leads to Jesus and how Jesus fulfills the law of Christ, uh, the law of love in our hearts through it. Okay, so, but this is, this is what we typically see. There is no connection. Again, unless you call Jesus. I want you to uh, post the next photo. And then you see the, the photo of the cross, right? So very simple graphic, the cross, Jesus dying on the cross, and now we have a bridge to walk through Christ to God. Now I know that this is a very simple graphic, but how many of you know that the gospel is a very simple message? Before Jesus, there was no bridge, at least bridge that was designed to be permanent, right? There was a temple and a sacrificial system, but it was always designed to be temporal. Jesus is the permanent bridge between us and God. When Adam and Eve sinned, they introduced a permanent condition, not just in humanity, but in each of us, and it's proved every day. Every day that I breathe, I prove it to be true, that I need a more permanent solution, and Jesus is that permanent solution. And this is what a pitfall prayer reveals, that we need Jesus. This is what Hebrews 10, 19 through 22 says. And so, dear brothers and sisters, we can boldly enter heaven's most holy place because of the blood of Jesus. By his death, Jesus opened a new and life-giving way through the curtain into the most holy place. And since we have a great high priest, who rules over God's house, let us go right into the, pres the presence of God with sincere hearts, fully trusting him. For our guilty consciences have been sprinkled with Christ's blood to make us clean, and our bodies have been washed with pure water. Jesus is our pathway to the Father. In if there is a benefit to a pitfall prayer, an impatient prayer, a selfish prayer, a divided prayer, a bitter prayer, an attention-seeking prayer, a prideful prayer, a lawless prayer, an insincere prayer, or a deceitful prayer, is that it reveals that we need Jesus. And because of Jesus' life, death, and resurrection, he becomes our high priest, our pathway, our mediator, the one who goes between us our bridge. So Jesus is our pathway to the Father, but he's also the pathway to pray the way that we were designed to pray. And, and I said it earlier like this, Jesus didn't come just to convert us, he came to convert our prayers. What does it mean to be a disciple of Jesus? It means to, and we're going to throw a verse on there, it's found in Luke 9, 23, to carry our cross daily. Now that Bill has said this, I feel like I can reference it every week, and you'll never be upset. Jesus has called you to die. 
And that's, by the way, that's what we talked about with the men yesterday. It was so uplifting. <laughs> no, it was. Because death is the pathway to life. Learning to carry your cross is the pathway to life. A pitfall prayer will reveal your own selfishness, your own sin, the ways that you don't honor God, the benefits to other people that will never happen because if all your prayers were to answer, no one else would get any benefits. It would just be adding to your comfort, adding to your riches, adding to the way that you live, but no one else is impacted. And if there's one thing that we see from the life of Jesus and the prayers of Jesus is that he was sent here for a purpose, other people. You mean this world does not revolve around me? <laughs> Don't condemn yourself. For real. Don't judge yourself and certainly don't judge others and don't condemn others. This is one of those moments where I just want you to close your eyes and ask yourself, does my prayer life reveal the issues where I refuse to carry my cross daily? It's about you, not your neighbor. Don't pinch them. Because if you're unwilling to go through the cross, you might be converted and your prayers will never be. You'll never discover the pathway in which you were designed to pray. The cross is the pathway. By the way, you could take this simple analogy and apply it to any area of your life, your marriage, your career, your business, but it most certainly applies to your prayer life. So Jesus connects us to God, and he also connects us to the way that we were designed to pray. And so this is the benefit of an unanswered prayer. You might think, well, and again, we're going to talk about prayers that aren't connected to any of these words, and these are just nine. It's a quick survey. There's lots more. And there are, there are uh, and, and if you've got a big prayer need in your life, I, I want you to understand, I'm not trying to be petty, but I, but I am trying to at least cover my tracks, cover my bases, that there might be, likely will be, probably will be some of these prayers that you really do struggle with. Deceitful prayer, insincere prayer, lawless prayer, prideful prayer, attention-seeking prayer, bitter prayer, divided prayer, selfish prayer, or impatient prayers, and lots of others. But there will also be prayers that you are legitimately bringing before the throne of God, like Hannah prayed for a son, and just not seeing it in the timeline that would make most sense to you. And we're going to talk about that next week. We're going to talk about impatience, patience, persistence, perseverance. We're going to talk about all the Ps, okay? <laughs> we're going to talk about unanswered prayers next week. But we're also going to talk about unprayed for answers next week. Because impatient prayers are directly connected to the idea of unprayed for answers. But this is, in, in terms of the nine that we've listed today, th these are the ways that God wants to change the way that we pray, okay? If and this is a big if, if we're willing to submit these pitfall prayers to the cross of Christ. And you don't have to. You can keep praying exactly the same way that you are. So this is one of those application sermons, man. I'm just dumping application on you. And just pick the one that makes most sense, that feels good, right? Like that you see the Holy Spirit. My name is all over that. There's nine. Maybe God will give you another one while I'm talking. Let's talk about the first one, deceitful prayer. How to pray, how to convert a deceitful prayer? Confess your sin. Be willing to be honest. Man, this is one of the reasons why I love AA. I mean, AA is more church than we are most of the time, a lot of the time. Now, some of you are going to be like, oh my word, they never even talk about Jesus. That's true, but at least they're willing to be totally honest. Isn't it weird how the church isn't always honest? We're not honest with each other. We're not honest with ourselves. This is the beauty of confession. And confessional prayer admits sin. Otherwise, you're just a liar. I'm a liar when I don't admit sin. Let me define sin. Sin is anything that misses the mark of the perfection of God. So there are a lot of areas where I miss the mark. 
every single person in this room has sin to confess. By the way, Jesus, uh, I, I'm not teaching on the Lord's Prayer, but if you actually adopt the Lord's Prayer as a prayer that you actually pray rotely every single day, it covers all of these. You know that when the disciples asked Jesus to pray, in his prayer, he says, Father, forgive me of my trespasses as I forgive those who trespass against me. He's teaching them that forgiveness and confession is a, a daily ritual. It's a daily conversation with God. Well, I, I, I thought you said that I was a new creation. You're a new creation that still has some old slave patterned ways of thinking. Not slave to another person, slave to sin. And, and just ask your spouse, okay? <laughs> I don't need to ask my spouse. <laughs> Tara, we're not going to apply that part of the sermon, okay? <laughs> Insincere prayer. Insincere prayer moves towards sincere prayer. Prayer that genuinely reflects a pursuit of Christ-likeness. By the way, the reason why I started with deceitful prayer is because I think deceitful prayer covers all of them. Just, it's another way of talking about every single one that I'm going to talk about. But are we genuinely pursuing Jesus? And expecting that God is going to answer our prayers when we know good and well that this is about me and my kingdom. And these prayers are not about his will, it's about my will. That is an insincere prayer. That's not a genuine prayer. You're talking to the, we're talking to the God of the universe. He, he knows insincerity. Insincerity is not just something that Generation Z can smell, okay? God can smell it. People, you know what I'm talking about. We know someone who is insincere. God knows insincerity. Three, lawless prayer. Become submitted prayers, recognizing God is sovereign and his boundaries are gifts. What is a lawless person? Someone who just disregards the boundaries that God places and expects things to go well. Read Proverbs. It doesn't always work out that way. And yes, you get some crazy dude or dudette who lives their own life and journey, but it always catches up to them at some point. Lawless prayers become submitted prayers. Prideful prayers becomes humble prayer. And, and, and actually, I, I thought about this, and it's like, you know, hey, we don't compare our sins to other people's sin. And that's true. That's a humble thing. But it's even more humble to compare, not to others, but to Jesus. Because when you compare your life to Jesus, you will recognize very quickly that I am so far away from who Jesus is, that there is a big gap. And what does that gap do? It creates condemnation if, if you're not a believer. But if you're a believer... You don't have to accept condemnation. You can receive conviction. There's a huge difference between condemnation and conviction. Some people are like, I don't like to feel convicted. Well, then you're never going to grow up in Jesus. But if I will receive conviction as a gift and recognize that there is a big difference between me and Jesus, guess what happens in my heart? I become a lot more humble. Man, I'm, just, I'm, I'm, a, I'm grateful that God is still working with me. Prideful prayer becomes humble prayer. Attention-seeking prayer becomes secret prayer where we find acceptance and approval in God alone. The worst thing that we can do in ministry is move out of desire for acceptance of others. I am fully accepted as a son of God. I don't have to do anything to seek your approval or acceptance, and neither, neither do you. You're, you're not on a stage. You're on a platform. There's a big difference. And what you do matters, but you're not earning your salvation. You're not earning God's love. You already have it. He loves you. He accepts you. And because of that, you don't have to seek attention through your prayers. You can have the kind of secret prayer life with God that doesn't need other people to hear everything that is happening in your life. And by the way, that will be a huge relief for so many of you. It'll be a huge relief. 
6, bitter prayer becomes grace-packed prayers. Grace-packed prayers are prayed by forgiven people. If you struggle with forgiveness, it's because you haven't received forgiveness truly from God. And so there's probably some areas in your life that work in progress. God wants to bring healing through forgiveness in your life. And I, I'm just telling you, when you feel the forgiveness of God, it is impossible to hold back forgiveness to others. Because you will feel the amazing agape love of God flowing through you. I mean, Jesus on the cross literally said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. By the way, that makes me humble because I don't pray like that. <laughs> okay, again, I mean, these, these, a lot of these are connected to each other. Divided prayer becomes faith-filled prayers following Jesus no matter the outcome. This is Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. I'm going to follow Jesus no matter what. Oh, yeah, but what if you die? I'm going to follow Jesus. What if you lose your job? I'm going to follow Jesus. I'm not going to get mixed up in having my faith in the thing that Jesus does. I'm going to get, I'm going to get mixed up and, and, and anchor my, my boat to Jesus, period. Who's called me to, to carry my cross. And eventually I'm going to die. <laughs> right? So that's, those are the two things that I know about my life. And I no longer have to live a divided prayer life where I'm hoping for the thing, uh, but that's faithless. I've realized everyone has faith in something. Everyone has faith in something because we're designed to have faith, to believe, to trust. But faith-filled prayers follow Jesus no matter the outcome. Selfish prayer becomes selfless prayer. It becomes compassionate prayer. It becomes gener generous prayer. Because it's directed to the benefit of others. It's directed to the benefit of others. James 4, 3. And even when you ask, you don't get it because your motives are all wrong. You, don't, you only want what will give you pleasure. Can you imagine how our world would be different if we really began to intercede for the needs of other people? For our spouse, for our kids, for our neighbors, for our church, for other people. By the way, I'm so grateful we have a church where there are a select group of people that get together on Zoom every single morning and pray for an hour. It's been happening, I think, for over three years. Almost a thousand days. If you want more information about that or try to figure out where that is, talk to me afterwards. Uh, it's just amazing. Every once in a while, I'll jump on there, and they'll pray for me, or I'll just listen to their prayers, and they're praying for the needs of other people. Unselfish, selfless prayers, compassionate and generous people. And number nine, our impatient prayers become persistent prayers. Now, again, we're going to talk about unanswered prayers and unprayed for answers next week as it specifically relates to impatience. But I do just want to say this one thing about this. God has a timeline. And part of us coming under the lordship of Jesus is recognizing that God may not be saying no. Just not yet. A no is different than a not yet. Okay? We're going to talk about this next week. We're going to dive specifically into this one idea. Remember Daniel when he started praying? 21 days he prayed, the angel came and said what? Man, I heard you, I, God heard your message on the first day, but it's taken me 21 days to get here. There are realities that we do not see that are impacting the world in which we live. Again, if you just want a simple uh, teaching tool, there, there's literally a click here button in my notes that will allow you to download the Lord's Prayer. And uh, it, it's not written with the nine points, but if you go through the Lord's Prayer and pray down the points of the Lord's Prayer every day, you will pray like Jesus. I, I mean, literally, you could memorize it, you could pray it uh, every day just simply, or you could pause and savor each line and think through each line and add to it, like, just like we did with the songs. What are, what are you praising God for? 
not rushing to the next thing, but just leaning in to this beautiful conversation that you're having with the God of the universe who's listening to you and who's loving just being next to you, having a conversation with you. Jesus uses unanswered prayers to change the way we pray, doesn't he? I remember in seminary, I was in my second year, and my dad was in his eighth year fighting a brain tumor. And from 16 to 24, I prayed for my dad to be healed. I want to explain that I understand that everyone is ultimately healed. That's not what I was praying for. (laughs) I was praying that the brain tumor would be shrunk down and destroyed by the powerful blood of Jesus on this side of death so that he could live another 50 years, 60 years, whatever, okay? I just want to be very clear about what I'm saying. And I was sitting there in a class listening to the professor talk about a New Testament book and I, I, I've actually shared this story before. I had a gray bracelet on, and it, it was connected to the cause of brain cancer. And right in the middle of class, I was just playing with it, fidgeting. This is before fidget toys, okay? <laughs> I created my own fidget toy, and it snapped. Now, last week we heard, we, we talked about listening to the voice of God. If you weren't here, go back and listen. Uh, and, and there's a book you can read by Dallas Willard called Uh, developing a conversational relation with God, hearing God. Uh, Jennifer's written a book called Chat with God, the the pathways to growing in your ability to listen to God's voice. Here's the thing I know about listening to God. When you know you've heard God's voice, you know. And the moment that snapped, it's like the Holy Spirit put such a strong and powerful answer in my heart. I'm going to take him. And within three weeks, my dad was in the presence of Jesus. It changed the way I prayed. Because not every pray, prayer that we pray needs to be converted, but sometimes our prayers do need to submit to the ultimate sovereignty of God. It's, this is, this is, we're going to get deeper into this. In fact, I'm going to use that story to launch kind of into... Persistent prayer, mysterious prayer, just this mysterious dance that is prayer with the Lord. And we're going we're gonna to try to go there in a half hour because that's all we get, right? But this week, I just want you to understand this simple idea that God will even use a pitfall prayer, an unanswered prayer, if we're willing to ask him why and go on a journey of filtering the possibilities that our prayers don't actually reflect the ultimate heart of Jesus for us. Because what happens is when we convert these prayers through Christ and the cross, this is what ends up, our prayer life ends up looking like. And and, and this is the thing. I believe every prayer has to be submitted to the cross of Christ. And there will be moments where God answers through the cross of Christ to a place where I see that that was what you did, Lord. I mean, if you've ever thought about this, just everybody Jesus prayed for died, right? So death means something different for a Christian. But my will was a little different than what you did. And if we're not careful, that pitfall prayer will keep us in the pit. But if we ask Jesus to help us, he will bring each of these prayers and the loads of others that don't reflect his heart for us to the cross where we lay them down and let God do what he's going to do. Transformed prayers reflect transformed hearts. If our worship team would come forward I want to pray for you this morning.